Starting. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Adventure Racing 101 from the Alpine Shop in Kirkwood, Missouri. I'm Emily. And I'm Scott Erlinson, aka Earl. And we also have David Fry from hi. the Alpine Shop Adventure Race team. And our co director, Golden Retriever Tess. Um, so I'm not going to really look at the video anymore. I'm just going to look at our audience. Um, and we have a really good crowd here, like 30 people or so, so welcome. Um, just to give you a little introduction into who we are and kind of why we're hopefully in front of you, educating you about adventure racing. Um, I've been racing since about 2009. Um, I, I'm sure if any of all of you are registered in the race, you've received your confirmation email and has a little bit about my story. Um, the Castlewood Adventure Race was my very first adventure race. And literally in the first five seconds of the race, I was like, oh my God, I love this. This is the best. So um, I've been racing ever since then. I just really like the team aspect. Um, I like being a co-ed race team. I think it's really great to draw on uh, all of our teammates' different strengths. Um, I've raced sprint races. Uh, most recently, Earl and I competed at the World Championships in Wyoming. Um, so that was a five and a half day race for us. So we're like, we just, we love the sport. We love introducing new people um, to adventure racing. And we want to give you guys a really great experience in December. So that's me. Uh, my name is Scott and uh, I've been in adventure racing since 2002. So I've kind of fallen in love with the sport and been addicted to it. But the first race I ever did was in Minnesota. I'm from, from Minnesota and I moved here two and a half years ago. but. We, I did it with people I'd never met before, and my uncle. And when we finished the race, the finish line was tore down, all the food was gone, and, but we finished. And I've been doing it ever since then, but it's just one of those things that it's like, no matter how hard it is, don't give up, keep going. And if something breaks, figure out how to improvise to keep going. And Encouraging that teammate that's like, I can't do it anymore. Yes, you can. And uh, so from that eight-hour race, it probably took us 12. And we still only did like half the course. Uh, I've gotten to see amazing parts of the world and done a lot of 24, 30, three-day, seven-day, 10-day races. So I got kind of hooked. But uh, yeah, and David's been racing longer than I have. Well, I guess I uh, is. Want to be on camera? Oh, okay. Might run out of time before I get. To... Nope, nope. <laughs> Keep on going. Uh, David Fry, and uh, I got into competitive orienteering in the early to mid 1980s, uh, and uh, that turned into, uh, which is a wonderful sport. That turned into adventure racing, and I was the navigator for uh, adventure race teams in 2000. It was my first adventure race. And then I guess Alp, Team Alpine Shop, I uh, forget exactly what year we started, but in the 2000, 2005, six, seven, I don't know, something like that. So we're Team Alpine Shop. Um, and then ended up racing with Emily in 2010 or 12? Somewhere anyway. around there. So yeah, so yeah. We've, been ra we've been racing together as Team Alpine Shop for, uh, for, for uh, many, many years. And I guess my word of biggest word of advice is uh, no matter how hard you try to go fast and win, keep it fun. It's like, uh, just even if your race is going bad, sometimes my most memorable fun races were ones that we did extremely poorly. Uh, of course, it's nice to do, nice to do well, yeah. but, but just keep it fun. Cool. Um, okay, so tonight we're gonna be talking about navigation and trekking. Um, so each of our four AR101 classes has a different sort of focus and theme. So today we're going to talk about navigation and trekking. Uh, then we talk about biking, uh, paddling. <laughs> we'll kind of weave in uh, gear that you need for each of these sports. Um, we'll have one night that's dedicated just to clothing. It's dressing for an eight-hour sprint race in December is really hard, like way harder than a 24-hour race in June. So we just want to make sure you guys are really prepared for that. Um, and then we'll talk about food, we'll just talk about race day logistics, um, 
just because an adventure race has a lot of moving parts to it and the more that you can kind of absorb and be expecting um, then the more fun you'll have uh, because you'll be you, you'll, you'll know what to expect instead of kind of being confused so um, let's get started uh, we have a little agenda here so um, we're going to just start with kind of a general overview of navigation um, how adventure races and really the most appealing thing about adventure racing to me is the lack of a marked course so before the race you'll get a map um, you might get more maps during during the race um, that you don't know about that are surprises but at least you'll start the Castlewood race with a map so you'll kind of have a general idea where you're going um, you'll be asked to plot different checkpoints on the map and we'll talk about that um, but basically you uh, will plot the checkpoints um, for most of the course the night before um, when you get to the start line there's not going to be any arrows painted on the ground there's not going to be any flagging ta tape through the woods showing you where to go um, I used to be a triathlete so I can say this it's not a triathlon this is about choosing your own adventure and navigating through the woods roads trails paths <clears throat> rivers um, of the area of the race course what you will see um, can you hold up the checkpoint? When you get to uh, checkpoints, when you correctly navigate to the checkpoint location on your map, you'll see an orienteering flag. Um, we'll have these throughout the course, um, and it has a little pin punch, and then it will also have a tag saying it's part of the Castlewood Adventure Race, and then also <coughs> what number it is. So you'll really know, okay, my map says I'm here, this checkpoint says I'm here, I know I am here, which is sometimes, I mean, we've all been through it, you know, you're, you're, you're not really sure where you are, and you're like kind of guessing, and then you see that checkpoint flag in the woods, and you're like, yes, such an amazing feeling. Um, so that's how you're going to navigate the course, with a map, and then you'll get to each checkpoint, and then we'll give you a passport to punch um, at each flag. Each flag has a different uh, pin pattern, so that's you'll turn that in at the end of the race to prove that you went to every single checkpoint that you said you went to. Obviously, the goal for the teams that want to win, they're going to get to every checkpoint, and they're probably going to be at the finish line in about four to five hours. Um, we set our race up so that you have eight hours to visit as many checkpoints as you can. Um, so some teams will come to the finish line not having visited every checkpoint. Um, but I think last year we had over half our teams clear the course. Um, so it's really, again, set up for doable for first adventure race. Um, so that's a little bit just about kind of the sport. You'll be navigating on foot during the trekking sections. You'll be navigating while you're paddling. Um, and then you'll also be navigating on the bike. So, you know, some teams only have one navigator that does it the whole race. Some teams switch things up between, okay, I'm gonna navigate on foot, I'm gonna navigate on the bike. Um, sometimes switch it up, uh, like you start with one person on foot and they're really just not doing a good job, <laughs> struggling. You might switch during a, during a one leg. Um, it's just, it's all a bunch of strategy. Um, how can you leverage your team's strengths to get to the finish line as fast as you can and visit all the checkpoints? Um, so that's kind of a general, overview. Um, you're not allowed to have any GPS uh, electronics. This is only map and compass navigation. Um, so just be prepared to be self-reliant. You're not going to have any gadgets or gizmos um, to assist you in the woods. Um, just kind of generally about navigation, um, there's kind of two camps to how to approach navigating um, from a map. One is the bearing and pace count camp um, and then the other is kind of a follow the feature orienteering style approach um, so we'll kind of talk about both and what is the pros and cons of each style um, navigating by bearing and pace count is a little bit uh, easier to start out with um, by bearing and pace count I mean uh, you hold up a map um, you use your compass to find the bearing in between two different checkpoints and then using the scale on the map you measure 
uh, how far it is going to be between each checkpoint. So it'll go something like you find you're at checkpoint one, you need to go to checkpoint two. It's a bearing of 90 degrees and you need to follow that bearing for 400 meters or about a quarter mile. Um, and then you're just, your job is to walk in a perfectly straight line for exactly 400 meters and you will arrive at the checkpoint with no problems. If there's a pond, you must swim through it. If, if there's a yeah, pond, yeah. you go straight through it because you are on your bearing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just kidding. <laughs> so that's, that's one approach. It's a little bit, um, sim in some respect, it's simpler because it's very kind of structured. Um, you have a, an angle and a distance and oh. that's what you do. Um, the other approach is to follow a more orienteering style navigation, which means you look at the map and the contour line, the, topo the topogra topographic map has contour lines and it shows you the hills, the valleys or re-entrance, the streams, um, and you kind of say, okay, I'm in a valley right now, my next checkpoint is on top of the next hill, but instead of going straight up this super steep cliff face that's right in front of me, maybe I should go kind of around the back of the hill and up the more gradual backside to get to that checkpoint. Um, so those are kind of the two approaches, and um, do you want to expound a little bit more on the, either of those? Oh. Now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the, the um, bearing and pace count is very good. It's the best way when you're in like a big a flat flood plain and green, you know, and briars, and you can't see anything, and there's no features. Um, you, you know, see that in like lake bottom areas and stuff, and, and uh, that's when that's when the bearing and pace count is the way to go. But especially in the hills around here, you might have a checkpoint kind of on this hill with like a ridge going around. This is pretty common, like a ridge going around. You can just like run the top. A lot, a lot of times there's a path or where a lot of people walk on the ridge and you can kind of go around. And if you do the bearing and pace count, you're like going down you know, through a steep gully and back up and you waste a whole lot of time. Um, so obviously you're, you're using contour lines. And I don't think we have enough time to really go through everything, but does everybody know what a contour line is? Okay, obviously when you have, uh, when they're very close together, that means it's very steep. And where they're very, very far apart, it's, it's not very steep because each contour line is at a certain elevation. One quick little thing about contour lines is, you know, you'll see like on a, a, a ridge where, or an area where they like, they'll make, make a, Oh, let's see, like this U shape here. There's a lot of U shapes. Well, it's the, a U shape where the contour line turns around. It, it's either a re-entrant or like where the water flows down or it's a spur, you know, on top between re-entrants. Well, a uh, quick little thing, if you kind of can figure out which is the hilltop and where the creeks are, the spurs, those U shapes point downhill kind of useful and the re-entrance though the U the U kind of makes a little you know points uphill. Um, I find that a little bit useful at times. Um, the uh, now I don't think we have time to do the whole spin the bearing or you want to do that? Well spin the actually compass. taking a bearing is like this is kind of why I have everyone put their emails in because there's like a million YouTube videos about how to take a bearing mm -hmm. and I have the best one and I send that to everybody after class yeah just so we don't have to like go through the minute detail it's very of it. mechanical so yeah if you yeah. follow the instructions it, it works yeah um, now what I like to do is um, I take I can sort of take bearings but by orienting the map I don't I don't the compass I use for use my little beer holder for my compass here. <laughs> uh, I use a thumb compass and it, there's no spinnable dial. It's just a big needle that settles fast, and I put it on my thumb, the same thumb I hold the map, and I put the, uh, so I'm, I'm going along, and I fold the map up, and say I'm going from here to here. I put the, uh, the uh, compass right next to, the, to where I am, and I just, when I look at the map, every time I look up, I put the map flat to let the needle settle, and I look, the first thing I look for is to make sure the needle, the north needle, lines up with the magnetic north, and all of your maps are going to have magnetic north lines on them. Or the, well, I mean, in Missouri, yeah, yeah. yeah and, and the uh, USGS here basically magnetic north is true north, close enough. Um, so the first thing I glance at, and this is like real quick. First thing I glance at to make sure the magnetic north lines 
drawn on the map are lined up as, as exactly as possible with the needle on my compass. So that's called orienting the map, which means now the map is, you know, this flat map is now turned exactly the way the world is. It's called orienting the map. Now, when you do that, one, when you, you know, you look at, the, oh, here, I'm here. Well, this hill's over, you know, I see this hill over here on my map. Well, if I look up, there's the hill. Oh, and I see on my map from where I am, there's a hill over this way. Well, if I look up, there it is. That's extremely helpful. Even if you're taking bearings, that's helpful. Because if you have your map just turned any which way, you know, how are you going to know where to go? I mean, it, having it turn every which way works on roads well. But when you're out in the woods, um, orient the map. And when you orient the map, you can sort of take a bearing by saying, oh, I am here, like at this circle, and I'm going here. Well, if I have the, orient if I have the map oriented, then where I'm going is always straight ahead on the paper. So if I draw an imaginary line, you know, on the paper that I'm going to kind of hold the map out in front of me a little bit, if I draw an imaginary line on the paper and I have the map oriented, then that is the way I'm going. And it's sort of taking a bearing, but I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not wasting the time to spin any dial. And when you spin the dial and you follow the compass, you're just doing that mechanical thing. You don't really know where anything is. If you do, if you orient the map, you're kind of doing both. You, you're kind of taking a bearing by drawing an imaginary line on the paper, and at the same time, you're seeing, oh, well, I'm going by this hillside over here, and oh, I'm going by this road. And, um, That's great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another just a useful hint is thumb the map. Well, I more than just about anybody, I turn my map into pulp. Of course, it's in a map case, so that's good. But I mean, I, I just, oops, <laughs> I, to, uh, I just take the map and I fold it up so that where, so that my thumb, or you can use the pointer of your compass or anything, but I use the tip of my thumb is where I am at this moment. And as I move, you know, as I move across the land, I keep inching my thumb along. So every time I kind of look and say, oh, I'm here, I, I'm, you know, I, I see, oh, I'm here on the map. I always move my thumb and pinch the map, you know, don't let it slide. Put my <laughs> thumb where I am. And that keeps you from getting lost. It also really speeds you up because you'll find you go along and, you know, if you just have the map any which way, you're like, okay, I should need to look at the map. I'm like, okay, where, where was I? Oh yeah. Oh. I was by a stream. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, I was but... there. Well, okay, I wasted a ton of time. Well, if you thumb the map and you do it religiously, um, then every time I want to see, oh, you know, how am I doing? Doing okay. How am I doing? Oh yeah, that's a, there's a hill right next to me. You know, it's that quick. So during a race, would you say you look at your map once a minute, five times a minute? If I'm on an orienteering course. <laughs> I, well, unless I really say, oh, I just had to run down this ridge, I probably don't let 10 seconds go by without taking a little glance, maybe mm -hmm. 20. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've got real good at running and just taking glances, maybe 20 seconds, you know, but I, these people who go along with a map, like on a string hung around their chest going through the woods. And it, it will be, some of you will have a map on a string and it's fine, yeah. don't worry. Yeah, yeah, okay, I don't, yeah, I don't mean to make you feel bad, <laughs> yeah. but... That's not really a good it. way to go. <laughs> Keep it in your hand. Look at it regularly. If you thumb your map, it doesn't really take any time to look at it. it mm -hmm. You know, if you just have to do this, oh, where was I? Well, then, yeah, so every time you stop, it's like another two minutes or something. Um, and so, so I'm assuming when you're thumbing the map, you're looking, you've got a tree, an oak tree, or a creek or something, you're kind of imaginary line? Sure. Well, the imaginary line in my head is, is the line on the map. And then when I look up, I'm like, you know, yeah, you see, I'm not that a accurate, like, oh, that tree. But but you kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm going over there. And I just kind of keep going. Um, another thing is use large features when you're going along, it, as large as possible. So if you're going a long ways, there's no reason, you don't necessarily have to know exactly where you are at all times. If you know, well, first, I got to go to this hill. You look on the map, there's a hilltop, I've got to go there. So, uh, 
once you when you do those little things saying, oh, well, I can simplify, oh, you know, there's all this stuff I got to do, but I got to go to that hill. Well, then you can kind of just go to that hill. I and mean, you don't have to follow each tree and stuff like that. And then when you get to that hill, okay, now, and as you get closer to the control, the more accurate you have to be. And you choose what's called an attack point. And an attack point, you don't have to, but I don't mean to confuse you. But an attack point is some big feature kind of near the control that you can find. Like, oh, the control is not too far from this little pond. So I'm going to go to that pond. Or a trail junction, yeah, like a or, T in the trail. So I'm going to go there. It's pretty close to the control. When I get there, then I'm going to really slowly, accurately hone in on it. And that's called an attack point. Will you see trails on the map? Yes, okay. you will. I think I covered everything. I mean, there's pace count, how to pace count and things like that. Mm -hmm. I find, and this is most people, if you're walking through the woods, if you're walking fast through the woods, through open woods, when you pace count, I just count one foot. I don't count both feet. I count like my right foot, one, two, as I go. And I don't pace count all the time. It's just when the navigation is tricky. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this, I better be careful. Um, a, a hundred meters takes about 60 paces. And Different. everyone can go out to their local yeah. athletic field, see how long or how many steps that it takes for you to go 100 yards or 100 meters, yeah. and then you'll know. But most okay. people, it's about, I would say 60 paces for 100 meters, a little more most of the time if you're walking in the woods. Um, so if you have, you know, the most, a lot of compasses have like a scale for 1 to 15,000. <laughs> so, you know, it, if it's a 1 to 15,000 scale, then each... You know, number is 100 meters are in a 15, 1 to 15,000 scale. Saying, because you only count one foot, is 60 paces. So it's really 100 steps. Yeah, really 120 steps, yeah. Um, and if a quick little uh, helper thing is that if you've got, as I say, most compasses have a 1 to 15,000 scale. If you're using a USGS 1 to 24,000, then, now this is just kind of tricky, a little then each one of those numbers on your compass is about 100 paces, a little more. And when I say that, you, you basically can lay those, your compass along where you're going, and you say, oh, I have to go you know, from zero on the little compass marker, it's like a ruler, mm -hmm. from zero to four. So that's on a 1 to 15,000, that's 400 meters. So okay, four you know, times six, so I have to 240 paces. And when we're racing with David, my favorite, I mean, everybody's favorite question to ask is, are we there yet? How far away is the control? And we ask that all the time, and David's favorite response is, oh, not too far. Not too much further. Not too much further, yeah. And it's just like, I don't know what that means. Is it five feet or like five miles I don't yeah. know because like really five miles in some races is not that much further <laughs> so um, but it's really helpful when the navigator yeah. um, can say okay we have a hundred more paces or 60 more paces or something like that because that gives the whole team kind of something to focus on and count together and like you know it's it's hard to every time have an accurate pace count so if you have a couple people on your team mm -hmm. that that's gonna be their job in the woods um, that's that's great to give people jobs, mm -hmm. and it's something that's really helpful. A lot of times when I'm navigating, especially late at night, which you're not going to have, and you get tired. Uh, rather than me, I just say, Jeff, give me, uh, you know, call out 200 paces, or call 400 paces, and then I can just think about it, and he'll be like, 100, 200, you know, 300, and I have a confession to make. Oh no. Um, <laughs> Not too much, oh, it's not too much further, is actually translated into, don't bother me now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the mental energy to Yeah, calculate. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. What is the control? You keep saying that. Oh, yes. Um, so control and checkpoint are the same thing, oh. which is the orange and white flag. Um, coming from an orienteering background, orienteers will call these controls. Adventure racers will call them checkpoints. Same thing, it's a fixed point in the woods that has a pin punch that everyone wants to go find. How do you navigate on the bike? Do you, are you thumbing the map? No, 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 you, yeah, you can't thumb the map while you're biking. 
Um, I, different people have different things. I think really the best I ran into where good was the enemy of better. Um, uh, I bought but never got used to these little things you go put on your your uh, bike handlebars. It's a mat board, and the good ones spin, and you, they got like clips that you can clip your map on. And if you're really clever, I've got a plastic spatula that I have sticking out away from the metal bike. It's embarrassing, but it works. <laughs> yeah, it's an upside down spatula, and it's got a compass on it, uh, so that I, as I'm riding my bike, I can see what direction I'm going just by looking in front of me. You know, it's going along. Uh, immensely useful. I mean, I don't expect you guys to do that, but if you get into adventure racing, you know, put up with the embarrassment, get a, you know, do the plastic spatula. Uh, some of the map boards, but the map boards, people will clip the map on it and they can spin the map so it's oriented, or roughly oriented. Obviously on your bike it gets much rougher. Uh, but when you're on the bike, it's you're usually on a road or a trail and um, you don't really need to do, I mean, I'm not saying it, the navigation's easy, but it's different. It's, it's a little bit more like going, you know, <clears throat> going across country in your car with, you know, your map book, which is, is that. I, what I did is I had a, I put a big clamp on the handlebar where I could stick the map, and then when I wanted to really look at it closely, I just pull it out as I'm riding, and I could hold it in my hand and, you know, do it, and then when I'm done looking at it, I can stick it in the clamp. I'm one of the few only people who do that, but uh, but yeah, the on the bike it's a little bit more like in the car. In a car. We'll try to re remember to bring a map board on the biking day. We've got one at home that we'll bring. Yeah, for a and little we, show and tell. And we see a lot of uh, like you know, there's map boards that you can buy. They're super slick. There's you can make your own with some binder clips, a piece of like clipboard, and some rubber bands like. Uh, zip ties also work really good mm -hmm. um, so I think before I had a like real deal map board I kind of had the same system as David as I got one of the like a plastic uh, clamp basically um, and zip that tied that to my yeah. handlebars and that was just like where I kept if I had a map or um, like doing gravel racing I had my cue cards there um, so there's just a lot of ways to kind of keep your map attached to your handlebars in front of you when you're navigating on yeah, the bike. You just, one main thing is even if you do have it in your hand, which I, I don't mind riding it, right, you know, riding with a map in my hand at times, but when you get into some technical downhill, you do need a quick way to get rid of it. I've, I've actually done some pretty gnarly downhills with a big map in my teeth. <laughs> or, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we're going fast, and oh my gosh, this is rough. I'm, um, I'm not saying, that's not, I'm not recommending doing that, right. but whatever it's not, works. It's better than dropping it. Whatever works, <laughs> yeah, or better than crashing. Um, okay, so I want to talk about a little bit the different kind of maps that you're going to see as part of our race. Um, you'll see one of three types and maybe a fourth. We don't know. The maps every year are different because our course every year is different. Um, this year we have a brand new course, uh, it's really, we think it's pretty cool. Um, we've been out there a little bit, checking it out, and you're going to love it. Um, so this is our, uh, this is a USGS map. It'll, um, this is probably the most common map you'll see for adventure racing. Um, so this is what USGS looks like, and this is what an orienteering map looks like. Um, this is actually our race map from uh, 2015, so the first year that Earl and I put this race on. Um, the Castlewood Adventure Race has been in existence for, I think, over 10 years now. Um, but Alpine Shop has only put it on for the last two, and then this will be our third year. Um, but you'll most likely see a USGS map. Um, these exist for the entire United States. It's a really amazing resource um, that we have. So um, they're organized into different quads, and then for the race we do a custom um, map for you. So we, uh, you can kind of see at the bottom here, there's four different quads actually represented in this one map. But instead of having you carry around four different um, pieces of paper, we just make you a custom map and then you get one piece. Um, we also put all the trails that we know about and that we think it will be helpful for you. We put those on the map too. Um, so you can kind of see we've got a uh, this particular race was over in Eureka by uh, Greensfelder 
County Park. Um, so we put all of the mountain bike trails in Greensfelder up here in blue. Um, here's uh, Highway 40 or Interstate 44 that's going across the map. We had paddled down here on the Merrimack River. Um, so this is just what a USGS map looks like. Um, anywhere that's green, it's woods. Anywhere that it's white, it's uh, developed. And then the roads and other features are traditionally in purple or black, um, just depending on what year it is. The trick with the USGS maps is typically the base topographic information is can be dated. Um, so this map was actually uh, drawn uh, in 1983. So, um, you know, Six Flags is over here and it's actually on here pretty decently. Um, but, you know, some roads have changed, some houses have changed. So um, just be kind of aware of that, especially with buildings and developments, you know, check the year that the map was produced. And if there's a building that you see that's not on the map, like, uh, it was probably built after that time. So it's just a little bit of <coughs> adjustment that you get to make. And purple is usually means new. Oh. That, that they, when they first do the map, like they did these maps back in the 50s and 60s and 30s and whatever, and that would be in black. And when they come back and do an update, they'll usually say when the base map was made and then when the update <laughs> and the new stuff in the updates, like new buildings, if you see black buildings, those are old buildings. And if you see purple buildings, those are the ones they added since the update. I don't know if that's useful for anything. <laughs> Yeah, just kind of be aware that, you know, maps were just a snapshot in time and things can change. Typically the contour lines are really fairly accurate, um, but like things that are developed like buildings and roads can be iffy. Um, so yeah, USGS map, uh, this scale, all the maps uh, have a scale at the bottom, the bottom of them. The USGS maps are traditionally printed at one to 24,000. Um, and then we also put a UTM grid on top of it. The UTM grid is based essentially an XY coordinate system um, that you will use to plot your points. Um, if you can go back to, I don't know, whatever year in elementary or middle school that you learned to plot like an X and a Y graph, you're going to get to revisit those days plotting points. Um, but it's basically will give you uh, two coordinates. You come over uh, the X distance, you go up the Y distance, and that's your point. Um, and uh, each of these UTM grids that's on the cor that's on the perimeter of the map is one kilometer apart. So that's a really useful kind of piece of information. Um, if you can, you know, have your mind thinking kilometers. One kilometer is 0.62 of a mile, um, and just you know extrapolate from there. Um, but that's kind of really helpful to you know just a quick reference. You know, you have two points. There, one of them is in each. UTM box and you know they're approximately a kilometer apart um, or you know likewise you can measure your whole course if you want um, so that's kind of the main highlights of USGS yeah. and if you're um, if you're ever confused about scales one way to think of it is I mean this is maybe too simple but but 1 to 24,000 means one foot on, on that paper is 24,000 feet in the world and one to 15,000, one foot or inch or whatever on the paper is 15,000 feet or inches or whatever your scale is on the ground. And by just by knowing that, especially if you have a calculator and a ruler, like if you're doing, you know, you can, it's pretty easy numbers to crunch. <laughs> so if you're ever doing, like if you're plotting your map, after she gives you the map and you're plotting and you have any questions, just take a calculator and crunch the numbers and take a ruler, if you, you know, and you're like, oh yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I do also, last year, can you grab that? Last year, uh, this was our main map. Um, it's actually a satellite photo. Um, we were in an area of Eureka last year that was had been so developed since the original USGS map had been created that the route that I wanted racers to take and to understand, none of the information on the USGS map would have helped you as a racer know where you are. There was a ton of roads that weren't mapped on the USGS map. Um, I think the river was a little, I know the river was pretty accurate, but mostly roads and buildings were just brand new and that USGS information, map, information wasn't helpful. So we actually gave teams a satellite map 
um, which had all those roads on it. It had the river on it. Um, and then we overlaid a trail system in uh, West Tyson County Park, um, where some of the orienteering and biking was. So just when we give you maps, we do our absolute best to put, to give you the type of map that, that's best for what you're doing. We put all of the trails that we know about on the map. Um, sometimes there's rogue trails out there that just, there aren't, there aren't part of any trail system, but they're just in existence. Um, but if we know about a trail, we'll put it on there for you um, so that everyone has the same information and kind of a level starting point. Um, and then orienteering maps, where'd that one go? Um, so then the third type, so we've got USGS, satellite photo, and then uh, orienteering maps. And orienteering maps are the most detailed map that you're going to receive uh, in one of our races. Um, they are specifically designed for very precise navigation. We're so lucky in St. Louis to have an actual orienteering club, the St. Louis Orienteering Club. Um, did anyone go to the meet on Sunday at Tyson? Yeah, a couple people? Okay. Um, so the orienteering maps are super detailed. They go down to mapping fire hydrants, root stocks, little ditches that sometimes have water in them and sometimes are dry. Like a boulder. A, bowl, a specific boulder. Like they're super detailed. Um, and if we're in a park that has an orienteering map, we'll, we'll uh, give you that information if, it's, if it will help you. Um, so we're, most of the parks around here have orienteering maps, which is not true of all cities. Most cities kind of are, maybe have one or two orienteering maps. We have like 12, I think, 10. Yeah. Um, and so more if you count the little, we've got a lot of the little city parks too. Kirkwood Park and Shaw Park. And, yeah, uh, Pillith I think yeah. has one. Yeah, so yeah. So um, we're super lucky and we're gonna share that information um, and just you know, shout out to the St. Louis Orienteering Club for producing those maps and then um, allowing us to share them with our racers. And um, really that's the best way to get to, to practice navigation and to practice orienteering is to go out to meets. Um, there'll be some fall meets coming up and then there's always a permanent course that's at Rockwoods Range. Mm -hmm. It's right across the, the street. From, Six Flags. Yep, yeah. right by Six Flags. Um, so the club has those maps for sale. I think they're five dollars. And then in the woods, there's there aren't orange and white flags, but there's stakes that are in the ground that have a number on them. And you can go practice orienteering anytime you want. Like pick mm -hmm. pick the sample map or the Rockwoods map up. Pick three controls or five controls or you know whatever you want to challenge yourself with, and go find them. And you don't have to have, people think, oh, I need an orienteering meet or I need a course to practice. You can practice with nothing, just get a map. Get a, uh, I like a, a uh, orienteering map. Quiver River is a great place. It's a little bit of a drive, but Quiver River, if you can get the Orient St. Louis Orienteering Club map of that. Uh, oh, there's a lots of great wooded maps. Uh, you can just pick, before you go, pick like a little pond or a, or a big creek junction that you'll know that you're there when you're there. You can pick features on the map that are kind of like, okay, when I get there, I'll know it. And call that your 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 control location. And then, you know, then of course, you know, make a course at where you're not just going up the creek the whole way. You know, make a course where you're going up over a ridge and then you come down, then you come down to the giant creek junction. So you're you're practicing navigating and nobody had to put out a course for you. You can just go any Saturday you feel like going. You just go. And uh, that's how you really get good. Is there's, there's nothing that can be taught in a classroom that will make you good, you know, without really just getting out there and practicing. And it's fun, especially if you can do it with friends. Yeah, bring your team out there. Yeah. Everyone take, you know, one control and then have a tryout to see who's going to be your navigator for the race. Uh -huh. And um, just make sure you tell someone when you're going to be home so that if you do get lost, and maybe what park you're, what park you're going to, <laughs> um, so that someone can come find you. Um, okay, I just wanted two more things about maps and then we'll get into trekking. Um, the first thing is plotting UTMs. Um, before, I'm actually going to cover this kind of after the class in a video, um, but like I said before, it's basically like plotting an XY graph. 
Um, so we'll give you, um, let's see. Yeah, so uh, we'll start here. So around the, the, actually, can I have the USGS map? It's a little easier to see. Yes. Okay, so uh, like I said before, around the perimeter, we've got uh, a UTM grid with the UTM, I guess, lines. Um, they all have coordinates. Um, so for example, they're all in blue here. This particular line that goes all the way across is uh, 4262000. Oh yeah. Um, the next one up is 4263000, uh, 4264000. Um, so that just creates a grid system across the whole map. Um, when you get a coordinate, it will have uh, basically the, the, we call them the big line number and then uh, the in the box number. So it'll have the, the big lines that you're supposed to find um, the intersection to. So let's say you'll come across 706000. You'll find this line. You're like, okay, this is my um, easting here. And then you'll come up 4261. Okay, that's my northing. And then we'll give you a finer set of numbers that will tell you exactly where inside this box your control is. So um, it's just kind of a, a process or a procedure that you go through for every single checkpoint. Um, and then you'll plot those before the race, the night before on Friday night. Um, we don't have any plotting during the race because it's kind of stressful and detail oriented if you're on the clock doing this. Um, so we're gonna give you Friday night before the race, off the clock, take as much time as you need um, to plot all your points. And then during the race, if there's any um, points that need to be given to you, you'll have a pre-plotted map um, or some pre-printed instructions so you don't have to repeat the plotting procedure during the race. Yes? So I know you have to stay within line of sight to your team, but yep. if you think it's got to be close, or I think it's got to be close, do you typically spread out to where you can see each other and then search, or do you stick together if you're looking for a point? Yeah, great question. Um, so uh, the question was if you are, you know, you're with your team, say you're a four person team, um, you think you're pretty close to the checkpoint, how far away can you get from your teammates to go look for it? Is that basically yeah. what you're asking? Or, or what strategy do you use? I mean, I, I know I don't want to lose her and then... Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, so super good question. Um, you need to, first of all, no matter what, no matter if you're close to a checkpoint, far from a checkpoint, um, you need to be within visual and audio contact of your teammates, all of them. Um, and then on top of that, no further than I think are, it's like 100 feet. Um, so you, that's just like all the time, no matter how near or far you are to anywhere. Um, and that's primarily for safety. Like you guys are going to kind of be in the middle of the woods. Um, and if something happens, you need to be right there with your teammate to help them. As far as if you think you're pretty close to a checkpoint, that's a great strategy to be like, okay guys, I think we're close to the checkpoint. The clue is spur. We've got a spur right in front of us. It should be somewhere on this, you know, spur nose. Um, let's just kind of spread out a little bit and I'll walk up it kind of like we're a search and rescue team. And if we're in the, where we think we are, one of us is gonna find that point pretty quick. Um, so that's yeah, a, if you're walking towards something, especially like if it's a rootstock or something that's not, you know, is distinct or, or as, as you know, a line, something's not linear. Um, like if you have a four person team, I think the navigator should go straight where he thinks it's most likely to be. Or like her. Her, or her, <laughs> yeah, is uh, uh, where, where she thinks it's gonna be. And then the other people kind of get on either side. Like you say, it's like a search and rescue, get on either side and just kind of walk, just make sure it doesn't go between you. And uh, and I, we don't do that very often, but it, it's a good idea. And that way you're not even wasting any time. You're just like this line going along. Yeah. But the other thing is, is that you can also, let's say you know exactly where that point is and it's straight ahead, you can do 50 meters, 50 meters, 50 meters too. So the person that's going to the punch is going further than everybody else, but you're still in line of sight. So you can use it this way and this way. So like if somebody's tired, they don't have to go, they need to go almost to the point, but not 
quite to the point. So it's like they might travel 100 meters less than the person that went with the punch. Sometimes there's going to be an all punch too, where everybody actually has to go to the punch. Um, but you know, we want everybody as close to the punch as we can. But just line of sight, four people, you can spread that gap a little bit. But but your best advantage is when you come up to an area and you need to search to fan out is very helpful. And keep talking when you're doing that because I mean I know I'm really guilty of this. Like if David has told us what the clue is. Yeah say it's rootstock, which is mm -hmm. like an overturned tree with its roots sticking out in the air. Um, you know, we get it's, we get to where we think that checkpoint is gonna be. He's like, okay, it should be here somewhere. Everyone look around. And then I'm like, I'm gonna find it. I just know it. And I, you know, pretty soon I'm like a little puppy, like over on the next hillside, like it's here somewhere. I just know it. So like when you're looking for a checkpoint, make sure to keep talking to your teammates too. Um, so that one of you doesn't get like super excited and all of a sudden you're like Where's everybody else? I had tunnel vision on this checkpoint and now I'm lost um, so You know just have some sort of communication system like So we're now looking we may or may not be looking for one of those You're always looking for one of these. You always will have a So plan. even on this tree stump that will be there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know this this looks very easy to find in this room when we're really close yeah. but like this time of year with all the trees kind of being yellowy and orange and brown okay. even though it's on a hilltop that's you know 100 meter hilltop it's still not like hi I'm here sometimes and we're, we're not going to hide these from you we never hide them like but if you're, if you're on the hilltop yeah. it's there but, like, you know, some race directors will hide them, and you might think that we tried to hide it, but it's just, there's certain areas where... We're telling you now, we don't hide We them. try to make this, we want you to get to the point, that's the main thing, is to get to the area where this is hanging, that's the hard part. We don't want you to get to that point and then like spend 20 minutes trying to find it. It's like, get to the hilltop, get to the reentrant, it will be there, and you're not going to have to like look underneath it cinder block or a bush it's going to be up there so that you do find it yes do you keep on saying the clue so that for each point there'll be kind of like a cue or a clue yes yes great question um so i actually printed out a clue sheet uh, one thing you can be be a little fun and clever you can have a little what what's our code word it means i found it so that all the teams looking around you don't go oh they found it let's go over there you know right. you come up with your silly little little code words and things like that like i guess they keep yeah. it fun right yeah it's uh and then occasionally it's like well that sentence didn't make sense i thought that was a code word those people just right. said like for i'll just tell you guys a quick story earl and i were racing we actually got to go to Belize for a race, which was amazing, like highly recommend it. Um, and we were, it was a three day race. I don't remember which night it was, but it was at night. We were looking for a checkpoint and uh, it was just like dark. There was a bunch of teams around us and we were like, it was kind of a confusing clue, but we thought we were in the area. And I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm gonna find it. I'm, got, I'm on my mission, you know, like I'm gonna find this flag. And Earl's like, Hey, come over here, Emily. I need to help you with your batteries. And I'm like, what is he talking about? Like, I just changed my batteries. My headlamp, because we had headlamps on. I'm fine. And I'd like keep looking for it. He's like, no, seriously, I need to change your batteries. And I think it took like even a couple more times. <laughs> like, <laughs> so we had, there are a bunch of teams looking for the control. It's a true story. <laughs> this is a true story. That was actually the Florida race. But it, oh, yeah. Florida, yeah. So we found it and there's a bunch of teams running around and nobody, but it's like, I needed to get her close to me. Another teammate was, I knew he was where he was going to get the checkpoint, but she had the passport, I think is what it was. So I needed to get her to me so I could go to the next person to get the passport. It's pitch black. It's like night three of racing. So everybody's just kind of, so that was my only way of, not saying, hey, the controls here, I need the passport. It's like, get over here now. <laughs> no, I'm fine. Yeah. No. 
<laughs> so no, it's really, like, I'm self-sufficient. <laughs> like, like a, a different, uh, a, a different sport where somebody's saying, "Oh, how, what's our code for?" One of us is really tired, and we need to slow the game down because we're really tired. And my brother says, "Well." I don't know what your code's gonna be, but my code's gonna be like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is like every team is gonna have their own little strategy for this, and we really just like, I mean, the more weird stuff we hear in the woods, like that's more power to you. That's great. So uh, in past years, how far have people traveled in this eight-hour period? Great question. Miles? I'm mean, obviously it's miles. Miles. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so our, the trekking portion or portions, you may have one or more. Um, so everything you do on foot will be between five and 10 miles. Um, everything you do on the paddle will also be between five and 10 miles. And then biking, uh, I think it's gonna be about 15 to 20 miles, somewhere around in there. So it's a good, like, it's a good yeah. day, yeah. 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 If you get them all, you, you've done it. <laughs> Do you mix them yeah. up there or like go from one to the other, back to another? Right. So uh, let's just, I'm going to combine all these questions like what, what's a clue, what do we do? I'm just going to walk you through the race that we did last year just so you can kind of know. Um, and then I have all of our maps and clue sheets and all the race instructions on our uh, kind of recap site from last year. So I'll send that out to everybody so you can look at them at home too. Um, so this is our clue sheet. This is what you got on Friday night before the two, 2016 race. Um, and it has, let's see, we had 32 checkpoints and you had to plot about 20 of those the night before. So adventure racing is not totally physical. Like you have to do a little bit of plotting and mental um, gymnastics, but that's why I like it so much. Um, so we started out last year with a trek. We had three checkpoints uh, for the first trekking section. Then everyone got in uh, boats and we paddled. Um, and then they got, uh, they had a really like tiny little run up to where their bikes were. Then they had another three checkpoints on bike. And then we got to uh, kind of the biggest kind of make or break trekking section of the race that happened to be in West Tyson County Park. Um, there were <laughs> 10 checkpoints, or nine checkpoints um, on foot there in West Tyson. Then um, from that, uh, from the end of that trekking section, then you got back on your bikes, um, rode back down to the river, paddled like a tiny little bit across the river, and then uh, had like a seven mile bike back home. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, you, you gotta be up for everything. It's not always, you know, again, triathlon, you're not always gonna do a fixed distance and a fixed order. It's gonna be whatever the terrain um, and kind of land features allow. Yes? Do you go to those checkpoints in order? Like in each section, do you like hit one, two, or three? Or do you, when you say plot your own course, do you use it depending on what you're going to do? Yeah, great question. So the question is, can you, uh, can you visit checkpoints in any order or do you have to go in sequential order? And the answer is a little bit of both. Um, so the clue sheet uh, for each different section tells you um, these checkpoints, you have to get them in order. Um, and usually that's because that's the best way to do it. Um, you know, we're not gonna tempt people into doing a crazy like back and forth zigzag course. Like we're gonna put you in order when that's the best way to travel. Um, then for example, the trekking section that we did in the middle of the race, that was any order because that really rewards navigators who can kind of look at a map pick out the best route in between checkpoints, and then um, guide their team through that route. Um, and then at the end of the race, they were uh, back in order again. So kind of a combination of both, and that's all written on your clue sheet. And then um, getting back to the clues. I think it's best to kind of assume in order unless you see otherwise. Yeah, definitely. In order unless you unless it's written otherwise. Hmm? Everyone starts at the same time. How do we get our bikes to that? Do we pre-position them and then go back and start? Yep, so there will be, uh, I mean, I can, there will be a bike drop. Pretty much every year at Castlewood, there's a bike drop. Uh, so that means is uh, the morning of the race, so Saturday morning, um, 
I think it's like we'll set it up for between six and seven a.m. We'll have a we'll give you a location, and you're in charge of bringing your bike to that location, dropping it off, and then going to the start location. And we will have a volunteer there from the when we when we it will be guarded. Is what I'm trying yeah, to you're say. not just dropping your bikes off and on we'll the have, side of some road. Like. We'll have somebody there that will like coordinate the drop off and then stay there till all the bikes are gone, so that so, you know, they're safe. So we'll pick it up there. Yes, yep. during the race. Yep. yep. Um, and then each checkpoint has a clue next to it, so it just tells you what you're looking for when you get to that checkpoint. So. Uh, for example, the clue for checkpoint number one was speed limit sign. So, okay, like the flag's gonna be on a speed limit sign. Uh, the next clue uh, was west side of cul-de-sac. We were in a neighborhood, so we kind of had some man-made clues. Um, the next one was boat ramp. So that's where you put your canoes into the river. And don't forget the punch if it's a CP. Some people get to a boat ramp, this happens many times. They get to a boat ramp, everybody's grabbing a canoe, and you get in and, and, you, and you're paddling down the river, and it's like, wait, there was a control, you know, I just saw the canoes and went to that, there was a control there and I forgot to punch, and I don't have, so that's really easy to forget. So, yeah. so you said cul-de-sac, so it's not going to be just in the woods right. or, yeah. it could be anywhere. We, right. yep, we are, uh, our control locations are, you know, sometimes you're going to be on some roads yeah, to be biking on roads for sure to like transfer between different locations so uh you know cul-de-sac street sign telephone pole stuff like that is all fair game when you are in the woods though um your clues will be uh natural features um the most common one that will that you'll see or the kind of the three most common i guess will be hilltop so top of a hill, reentrant, and spur. So like David talked about a little bit in the beginning, uh, reentrants and spurs are both topographic features. Um, and how I just like visualize these, if I don't have a, you know, if I can't point to them in real life, you kind of like make a fist. And then, uh, so for example, the knuckles are like a ridge line, and then the spurs are gonna be your fingers kind of coming down off that ridge line. And then the reentrants are going to be the little valleys or gullies in between these spurs. So this, this is like super common in, in Missouri. We have a ridge reentrant system. So we've got lots of ridges, lots of spurs, and then lots of reentrants in between the spur. So um, if, if a control is hung in, the, in a reentrant, it'll be in the middle of the reentrant, um, kind of at its lowest point. So we're not putting it on the side or anything. What percentage of us do you think will feel significantly lost at some point? And what percentage of people usually finish? What, um, like, who, have you had most teams finish? Yeah, so last, I think the last <coughs> two years, every team has finished under their own power. Some teams have skipped checkpoints. Probably less than half of our teams end up skipping checkpoints. Over half of our teams get every checkpoint. Um, we're not putting these in like super obscure middle of the woods hillside good luck go get it we want to make this i mean we want it's a navigational test we definitely want to test you um, and your team navigation um, but all of our kind of controls that are in the woods you'll be able to get to like okay if i go to this trail junction and another couple hundred meters into the woods that's where my checkpoint is going to be so they're all like kind of within um, some really recognizable feature that you'll be able to attack off from and go punch. So our goal with this race is, you know, a lot of you in this room are first time racers and we're going to have of that 250, probably over the half that field is first time racers. We want you to have a successful race. You're going to have to navigate, but we're going to make it to where it's a doable event for 60, 70 percent of teams to get all the control points. The other percent will finish under their own power and maybe get three fourths of them or at least half. We want you to fall in love with the sport. So what happened is some races made them too hard, a six hour, an eight hour race where the fastest teams were finishing in just that time frame, where the new teams were getting there and they didn't even get to do half the course 
And they're like, why would I, you know, they just leave frustrated. So our goal is to get you to fall in love with the sport, make it doable, have fun, but still challenge you on top of it. It's not, we're not gonna make it easy, but we're gonna give you the features and the maps to where if you work together as a team, practice some navigation, you'll get it done. And we're, and that's part of these classes is to, to give you some heads up. So we've got four of these. And when you go home, watch videos, you can come in and ask us questions and we'll try to help you out the best we can. So we want to make a challenge, but we want to make it fun and doable too. But if, it, if you think it's too easy, go faster. Yeah. It gets harder when you go faster. Yeah. This, David and I are kind of like opposite. Like this, when I was racing, and I, I mean, I still race. I just like to race direct for this event. So when I was racing this event, it was always like the most nerve wracking event of the entire year because it was like full on, full gas from the moment you say go to like four or five hours later, cross the finish line, you're done. One little mistake, like, oh my yeah. gosh, the race is over. Yeah, and, and I, I, I don't like that. And, a short, oh, I love it. And yeah, it's, loves it's it. intense. Like, I mean, a, short, a short, fast, quote, easy race means that you can't make any mistakes if you want to win. And that's that's fun. Yeah, you know, let's move your chair here so we don't have to keep moving the camera. Su uh, you know, super hard, um, you know, technical long races. Like, oh, I totally screwed that one up, but you know, that's not good. But you know, everybody will screw up. It's it's tolerated. Screw ups are tolerated. Where you know, the shorter and the faster. It's like you know, game on. on point. Yeah. Can't make a mistake. Go fast. And I, I like that. So, so easy. Like, I'm an experienced racer, and I kind of like the easy ones. And then you go super They're fast. They're fast and furious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you say super fast, do you yeah, mean like during the track and car you're actually trail running? Yeah. Okay. If you can. I mean, obviously, if you, you know, uh, the better shape you're in, the faster you can go. But, but it's fun. Yeah. The um, fastest is always me that doesn't do the quickest way. Right. right. Yeah. Like right. 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 Accurate I, is all. Accurate always beats fast and you know. Yeah. Always. When I navigate, like as a lead navigator, I cannot go as fast as I'm physically capable because I get lost. I can't keep up mentally with the navigation. Um, so I can go at like a brisk hike is my navigating speed, and like that's the speed I just know I can go unless it's a pretty like straightforward trail run point to point. Um, if you do a brisk yeah. hike, but go straight to control, to control, to control, you're going to beat 90 plus percent of the teams. Yeah. I mean, that's accuracy is, is uh, I don't know about 90, but you're going to beat most. Yeah. Accuracy is, uh, <coughs> is key. Yeah. I raced with the previous owner of this race, Gary Thompson. He's from the Lake of the Ozarks area. Um, he's an older gentleman, mm -hmm. but super experienced navigator, doesn't really like to like you know, raises heart rate all that much. Um, and Gary, if you're watching, like, hi, um, <laughs> I like you a lot. Um, but you know, he just was like such a great navigator. So we were doing a 12 hour race in the Lake of the Ozarks area. We were like mid to back of the pack kind of for most of the race. And I was still kind of a new racer. Um, and then we got to the last trekking section and we hiked the whole thing and we came out in third, like, Gary is so accurate, and all we had to do was just keep moving at a steady pace, and we passed like half the field just on a navigation yeah. section. So, don't outrun your navigation. Yeah. Um, okay, just like a couple of things I want to touch on for trekking. We've kind of been a little bit all over, but that's totally fine. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, we just talk about trekking and some gear that will make your day um, more successful. So, we talked about what to do when you get to the to the flag, someone will have the passport. One person goes up and punches the passport at each flag, um, and then you'll turn that passport in at the end. Don't lose it, have like a special pocket, um, something with a zipper, maybe in something in your pack or on your shirt or in your pants that you, know, you can keep that passport with you the whole time. Um, for shoes and socks, Earl, give us your recommendations. You have to be clipless pedals are not recommended. Either or. If you, you if you want to do clipless, pedal, clipless pedals on the bike or just flat pedals on the bike, whatever you're most comfortable with, just be aware that you have to carry your trekking shoes if you're going to switch shoes. So most of the top teams use clipless pedals. Yeah, so for this race, you can take your pick. At the bike drop, we'll allow you to drop 
your bike shoes and your bike helmet and bike related stuff. So that morning, keep in mind it could be really cold and snowy and wet, but you can leave those items with your bike. But then you will need to carry your regular shoes with you when you leave. So everything you leave with your bike that morning needs to go with you. We're not going to haul your gear around. But so that's a team just each you know each team can figure out how they want to do it for a race this short. If you're not used to it, just do go with what what you know. Um, for shoes, just a basic trail runner <coughs> is your best option. You know, if you've got just a road pair of regular road shoes, if that's what you want to use, that's fine too. If you don't want to go buy a bunch of gear for this race, we want to keep the gear list as simple as possible. But a, a good trail runner with a good outsole with some grippy is going to be helpful. Might be a little slick, could be a little muddy. Um, just depends on. We've been super lucky with the weather the last couple of years, so hopefully be a blizzard this year. Hopefully we're lucky again. <laughs> I came down four years ago to do the race with Jeff or Jeff, David, and Emily, and it had snowed the night before, so it was a little bit chilly. But we're hoping to continue that. Um, socks, you know, a wool sock or a synthetic uh, is your best choice. I always prefer a thin sock because it's going to dry faster when it's wet and it's just less stuff going on in your shoe, but it each has their own preference. They also make like a thin stock with a little more cushion to it, so you get a little more protection on the ball of your foot and the heel, um, you know, and it just depends on where you are with your shoes. Um, I always like a shoe with a little wider toe box because for the longer races, our feet swell up, so it just gives you a little bit more room in that shoe um, to do that. For an eight-hour race, I don't think we're going to worry about too much of that going on. Um, pretty simple. Cotton socks, I would highly not recommend it. Um, it's just bad. Um, any questions on shoes and socks? I work at the shop here too, back at the bike shop, so if you have any equipment, gear, stuff going, questions, just come back and see me. Maybe call ahead to make sure I'm here, but I'm normally closing a couple nights a week, so I'm here until 9 o'clock so I can help you with any of those things. Um, wet conditions normally lead to wet, cold feet. Uh, this is where we used to pick up dog food. But your feet fit in them really nice. So it's like I'll wear this next to skin sock over the top of it and in my shoe It's going to be a really wet and cold morning. You don't want to get your feet too clammy But on a wet morning or if you're coming off a paddle going to a bike your feet are going to be wet if You have dry socks great if you don't you know This is just one of those things that doesn't weigh anything, but it does amazing things it saved me a lot of times. Um, same thing with hands, a little latex glove underneath a regular glove creates that vapor barrier again and keeping it getting wet. These two items are super super light, don't really cost much but their risk versus reward is big. Also shower caps helps retain heat in your head. This is, those are just simple things to do when the weather gets cold. Uh, you want to talk bailout bags? Uh, we're kind of running short on time. Um, so we all, we, both Earl and I keep what we call a bailout bag in our pack. Um, and it, I carry a shower cap with me, and I'm just going to put it on for your entertainment. Um, but these are like, you know, a dollar for ten of them. And they look super funny. But uh, if you're like paddling and you're cold, this is super lightweight. It can fit over a bike helmet too if you happen to be wearing your bike helmet. And it's amazing how much warmer it will make you. Um, it just kind of retains all the heater on your head and it looks ridiculous, but um, it's just like super lightweight, super easy to carry around. 
and it kind of just keeps in all your heat around your head and makes you feel warm. Also in our bailout bag are the poop bags for your feet, latex gloves. Uh, we keep like an extra set of batteries. I keep an extra hair tie because you know what happens when a girl loses her ponytail holder, like it's bad news. Um, we keep some ibuprofen in there, some foot lube, just a couple little things that, that can make your day really a lot better um, just by having them and they don't weigh very much. Try to be done here in two minutes, five minutes. Yeah, two or five. <laughs> so, backpacks, pretty much everybody's going to want or need one for the race. If you've got one that already was going to work, perfect. Um, some recommendations. Um, yeah, all right. Go. So, a couple of the recommendations that um, I've had a lot of success with are the Osprey packs. This is the Talon 33. This is the Talon 22. Both these packs will be, will be uh, we're getting a low battery. Okay. Um, will be a great pack for the race. One of the biggest things that, that I look for are hip pouches to carry food, items that you need. I always carry food in one side and then like ibuprofen, vitamins, gum, I was like to have chewing gum, those kind of things, and then other side. Um, and then just basic, simple, you don't need a lot of zippers and just um, I was like a dump compartment that you can put stuff in and then a smaller compartment here to put some essentials that you might need, you know, sunglasses, those kind of things. That are easy to get to here. The other thing is, is your team, you know, you can always have a teammate help open and close your pack too, so you don't have to take it on and off. Um, Do you have a bladder in come in multiple different sizes, three liters, and different brands too. Three, three liters, two liters, one and a half. I think our mandatory gear is going to be 70 ounces, so that'd be a two liter bladder. Um, probably the most popular one is Camelback ones because that's a brand that everybody knows. Um, Do you have a water stuff for you, Phil? Oh, I'm going to drop there. No. Wow. That's why you have iodine and water treatment. There'll be plenty of plenty of water out there. I mean, if it gets, if it's all of a sudden an 80 degree day in December, we'll figure out something <laughs> to help you out. But, you know, 70 ounces, and then you can have two bottles on your bike or three bottles on your bike. That's going to get you over 100 ounces of fluid for eight hours. Uh, or you can carry a three, I mean, you can always carry a three liter bladder too. You don't have to carry, you know, a minimum. Um, so, Different bladders, different personal choices there. But yeah, so when you're looking for a pack, I would definitely pick one that does have the hydration location, or a lot of them just come with a bladder as well, but just make sure that it's the right size bladder for what you're looking for. Uh, any questions on packs? These are, this is just kind of quick, but we just don't have a lot of time. What size do you generally recommend for like a race? For a race like this, um, depends on who you are on the team. I would carry a larger one because I might need to take other teammates' stuff. Whereas Emily will have her in the smallest pack that we can put her in, just to keep everybody faster. So it's like there's no right or wrong. But for a race this big, if you're carrying a pack bigger than this and it's full, we should have a conversation because you're carrying way too much stuff. And this is how big? 33? This is a 33. 33 uh, liters. 33 liters. So this, this to me, this is a pack I would carry, this is a size pack I would use in a 24 hour to a 30 hour race, as well as potentially a multi-day race. It's the perfect pack for a lot of things. So, and it cinches down small, so if you don't have a lot of stuff in it, it's not gonna be flopping around on you. And, yes. 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 Yeah, you could have one person 
Um, so for the mandatory gear list, you know, you have to have that amount of gear per person with you with your team. But if it's one person that wants to carry all four emergency whistles and all four hydration systems and you know all of that, like and then the three the other three teammates are like trotting along with nothing, <laughs> like game on. Like it's all about leveraging who's on your team and how much work that everybody can do relative to each other. Um, and that changes during the race too. Like, you know, like Earl said, he's really good at carrying a lot of stuff um, and a lot of my stuff, <laughs> so thank you. Um, but sometimes, you know, he's just having a bad couple hours or a bad evening or, you know, whatever it is in the race. And that's when you're like, okay, buddy, what's in your pack? Can I take some of it? Um, just, you know, for a little bit. For this race, maybe it's less than an hour. Um, you know, maybe someone's really good on their feet, but on their bike, they're just not comfortable. So like you take that person's bike when they're, or you take that person's pack when they're biking and they take yours while you're on foot. Um, you know, that sort of swapping around is encouraged. Um, just as long as anytime we have a gear check, we ask for four space blankets. If you're a four person team, you show us four space blankets. Um, and we do have mid race surprise unannounced gear checks so it could be anything and we'll get into a lot more of those dynamics into in the teamwork side of it that that class but you know when you're all four of you are together that works great but if you ever get separated due to an injury or something like that you need to be smart about how you're going to divvy up that stuff and maybe that injured person needs all four space space blankets to keep warm while two other people go i mean just need to use common sense on those things but yeah sharing of gear and load whatever you can do to make your team go as fast as it possibly can best strategy and then one more thing about clothing during your trekking section um in yes in missouri you're going to want to cover your legs in some form or fashion as much as you can during the foot sections. Um, we have some pretty nice woods around here, but there's all sorts of little briars and brambles and small undergrowth um, that over time, as you kind of bushwhack and go through the woods, they're gonna start abrading your skin and maybe cutting it. And it's just not a pleasant sensation. Like, you know, it's kind of like pain by a thousand cuts. Um, so, Make sure you have some sort of trekking pant, um, nice and lightweight so it dries quickly if it gets wet. Uh, tights work well. Um, I am a really big fan of wearing uh, like a calf sleeve from my ankle up to my knee and then a pair of three quarter tights over that. Um, so it's just a little bit kind of more modular system. There's uh, hiking gaiters that you can use like either ankle height or knee height. Um, so there's all sorts of strategies to covering the skin on your legs, but just make sure you consider it. And we'll tell you guys, and someone's going to be there, maybe not in a Speedo, but like in short shorts, and you just like give them the thumbs up and say good luck, and we'll see your legs at the end of the race. Um, and your arms, it's like it's nice to have them covered, and you probably will because it's in December, um, but they're not as critical in the woods to have your arms covered. Probably not something that you're going to want or really need during this race are trekking poles, but for a lot of our longer expedition races, we'll use trekking poles um, just because your packs are a little bit heavier, you're going up and down a lot more, and it just helps take that load off. And sometimes you might just use one of the two, but it's just as you get into some of the longer stuff. Um, so it's an option. And there's a million different ways, you know. You can go all carbon fiber, lighter, you know, just, but they're, they're out there. And the last thing we'll talk about, and then we'll do any questions and kind of any, yeah, anything like that, uh, is the trekking toe. Um, so in addition to like sharing gear, um, or you know having someone carry your pack you can also use a tow system um, so we have a couple homemade versions that we'll just share with you um, 
So it's basically two really lightweight carabiners and then a piece of bungee cord in between them. Um, just tied like super simple knot. And um, how these work is uh, most packs have some sort of loop on the back of them, like either for um, ice axes or some sort of lash point on the back. Um, on Earl's, we like made this special little pink toe loop because he does toe me specifically quite a bit. Um, so this will go on his pack. And then this will, on my pack, it'll just go on the waistband, like clip right here. And then um, you're just like hooked up and kind of sharing some energy. Um, it's not like, you're not getting dragged along. This is not torture, um, but it's really just like a nice little encouragement for someone who's kind of struggling on their feet to get a little bit of uh, like toe bump um, every so often. And then it keeps everybody together too, which is good for morale. Um, I know when I'm really struggling, I kind of fall behind the team. And then it's even worse because I kind of create the situation in my mind like, oh my gosh, my teammates are all up there. They're all talking, they're all having a great time. And I'm back here and I'm so slow. And it's like kind of mentally defeating. So if you can devise a way to like keep all of your team together and um, just like sharing that energy and trying to cheer each other up, um, that's what a toe is useful for as well. She recommended a shock collar. Which... Yeah. Shock collar, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go, go, go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, any, you're, it's open. Yeah. Who, who wears a shock collar? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. Um, okay, so any, I know you guys were asking questions during um, our, class, but does anyone have any questions at the end for us? <laughs> yes? So is there any chance that you call a mud out if the trails are too rough for bikes or running? Great question. So um, is there a chance that we call a mud out or other alterations to the course if things are too muddy? So uh, the first strategy we have against that is actually having you plot all of your checkpoints the night before. Um, that gives us really until the last minute to give you a course that will work for the conditions that are forecast relatively close to the event. If we had to do, uh, if we did pre-plotted maps and we would have to decide the course, you know, three weeks in advance and then we couldn't change it. Um, so that's why you pre-plot or you plot your maps the night before. But if there is some sort of condition like the trails are too muddy and we're going to tear them up, if there is a flood on the river or a drought on the river, um, we will have uh, volunteers throughout the course to notify all teams of any changes that happen after you get your clue sheet on Friday night. So yeah, we don't want to be like causing damage to the woods just because we have one race. Um, we want those trails to be there for everybody. So good question. Yeah, so a, little, a question about Friday night. What time do you get all of your information? Um, Check-in opens at 4 p.m. It's here in this exact store, 4 p.m. on Friday, uh, December 1st. And then uh, we want you to check in before 7, just so we're not here until midnight. So um, one person from the team needs to come and get all their stuff. We'll hand out maps, clue sheets, uh, any directions that you need, uh, like for parking or anything. Um, we'll hand all those out Friday night. Um, if you're fast plotting, you can you do like a point a minute, maybe a couple points a minute. Yeah. So if you're, I mean, just if you're like super fast plotting team, um, you could have this whole course plotted in 20 minutes and then maybe spend another 20 minutes like, okay, we're going to do this, 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 and we're good to go. But um, you're off the clock. Don't hurry or maybe go through it twice because we've misplotted and boy, that ruins your day. Yeah. So yeah, since you're off the clock, um, I mean, I would really recommend just planning to spend um, as much time as you can with your team. So like, go get a pizza, go find a quiet, uh, like someone's living room, quiet nook in the store. Um, restaurants are hard because they're kind of dim and noisy, um, but just a quiet place where you can all get together um, and look at the map and kind of plan your day um, and then get to bed early. So. We use, uh, we use a lot of highlighters and stuff. Highlighters, of yeah. Time to um, mark the map. I uh, actually brought, so these are maps from Belize. Um, so we we took our time. We had like a whole day to work on these. Um, so it's like, you know, 
when we got this, this was just a blank map. And then we took the time to like, okay, for trekking, we're gonna use pink. And for paddling, we're gonna use blue. And then for biking, we're gonna use orange. So like we mapped out like everywhere we wanted to go, um, where the checkpoints were. We actually measured the distances like between uh, trail junctions or checkpoints or something so that we could tell like while we're biking, you know, okay, the next checkpoint is 5K or five kilometers away. Um, so like the amount of detail that you wanted to put it, that you want to put in your maps is like totally up to you and up to your navigator. Um, but like you can do it in 20 minutes or you can not sleep the night before and you know, spend all night going crazy. Um, but I think in general, like two hours, you should be able to get a good plan together. Um, have, you know, that's including eating dinner and you know, spending time with your team. Any other questions? Oh, great question. Can you wear your Garmin? You cannot wear it in a way that you can see the information um, because that's technically you could measure. Correct. So you, but what you can do is like, I'm guilty of this too. I love having a Garmin with me to like upload to Strava later or track my steps for the day. So what we do is if you want to carry a Garmin with you, we're going to give you a, like an opaque plastic bag. Um, it's not a waterproof bag or anything, but you can stick your watch or other GPS recording device in that bag. Um, you seal it up and then at the finish line, we just ask you to unseal it in front of us so that we know that you didn't check it during the race. Um, but then you can upload it afterwards and like I loved seeing the Strava flyby after our race last year. Like you could see like the teams were together, 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 and there was like explosion. So um, it was super cool. We want to encourage, um, you know, recording the race, but we just don't want you to look at that device during it. So, so I could start Strava on my phone as long as it's in the pen and throw it in the bag and then yep. you're good to go. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. But it's not waterproof, so like um, anything you need to keep right, safe so from water. It's... Okay, great. So we will probably have a mandatory tape those shut a half hour ish. Something like that. Something like that. But it's like you're not going to be moving much, so right. you can just subtract that dead time, and then once you're done, you open it up, hit stop, and save, and all that stuff, so you have your track. So like Emma said, we're going to encourage that to happen. Any other questions? Okay. Um, we'll obviously hang out here. The store is open till 9. Um, so take your time. If you've got something you want to come up and talk to us about, we'll be here. And I'm ending the video. Bye, everybody.